My name is Billy Pruitt. Back in the 60s, I had the privilege of playing alongside some incredible black musicians. These blues legends included Otis Rush, who asked me to join his band with the great Sam Lay. They taught this white boy some blues. Today I'm interviewing my friend of over 50 years, Billy Pruitt. Not many know of him, but back in 1969, the Chicago Sun-Times featured Billy and other great blues performers. The title of the article was Black, White, and the Blues, and of course Billy was the white. Back in those days, Billy was playing with Blues Hall of Famers Otis Rush and Sam Lay. As a witness to some of it, I know he's got some great stories for us. I don't know. I'm in the artist protection program, and my career is the best kept secret in show business. Okay. Hey, Billy Pruitt. Fancy hey, meeting man. you in a blues club. Uh, well, that's where, this is where I live. Now you know where I live. Well, we've both been in a good number of them in our day, and as long as we're here, let's talk some blues, and we might as well play some blues, too. Hell yeah. Okay, so we'd go down to Maxwell Street, and it'd sound like this. And... It's been a while, right? A few years? or Well, it goes back over 50 now. In fact, I can tell you the exact day that I met you because I still have the poster. It was when Otis Rush played at the Viking Temple at 68th and Emerald, and it was November 9, 1968. Wow. That was when you were playing with Otis. It's all gone from there. That was a social club. That was... Uh, of course, seeing you with Otis Rush, uh, that was a great meeting ground, but uh, let's talk about how you got there. So All right. let's rewind and go back to the beginning. My dad was from Kosciuszko and he was raised, uh, you know, typ typically Southern. And some of my first memories of music was uh, uh, riding in the back of my dad's car. I'd stand behind the driver's seat and I'd look out the window about this high. And one, one day he passed by a it must have been a blues bar and i was probably just four or five years old and there was there was bending strings it must have been a shuffle i don't i don't know i don't know what it was and but I, I knew i liked it was there a part of your upbringing that led you to seek comfort or escape in blues yeah later on they sent me to spokagan summer camp in angola indiana and we used to sit around the campfire and sing straight songs you know folk songs and all and some some guy had a harmonica i said man that's kind of a cool instrument and so i i got a harmonica and i realized i could put that in my pocket and it was my friend and i could just take it wherever i wanted do you remember the first blues artist or blues band that you saw live in the circumstances i remember it was lonnie mack the first blues person that i ever saw live uh, if you could say lonnie mack was blues because he had a tremolo and he had it was the first bass guitar I ever heard. Right? Not done I think it was Memphis. And I had just put a band together, and I, my buddy and I, uh, we, we were both lead guitar players, and so I wanted to have a. I heard about guitar bands, so he knew a drummer. He he knew a drummer, and we got this drummer, and then he knew another lead guitar player. So my first band was three lead guitars and a drummer. We played for for like uh, four or five. We were, months it, we were house band at this place and it leaves it left something to be desired you know because it was three lead guitars and a drummer and i knew it was missing something and so one night i heard on the radio lonnie max playing a bar downtown i was 16 years old and i was the leader of the band because i had a car the other guys were 15 years old and so i, I had to go see lonnie mac i i heard it on the radio I, I heard i think it was memphis and so i went down downtown and uh 
of course, they wouldn't let me in the bar. The bouncer wouldn't let me in, but he let me stand on the sidewalk way away and look into the, into the bar. I saw the, uh, the lights again, reminded me of my dad's neon. I heard the sound. I said, wow, that's, that's the sound I'm looking for. I don't know what that sound is. And it was just so full. I couldn't, and then I noticed one of the guys had, uh, had four, guitar, uh, four, four strings on his, on his guitar. And I'd never heard that, you know? And I said, Jesus, that's, I, that's, I gotta get this sound. So they took a break, they came out, I ignored Lonnie and I talked to the bass player. And I said, what's, what's, the, what's the four strings? He goes, well, that's called a bass guitar. And I said, well, how do you get that sound? He goes, well, you just pluck it. And it had so much bottom. So that was uh, where I discovered bass guitar. So I was on my way now. I heavily got into James Brown, so I got a James Brown wig and a James Brown cape, and I used to do all this footwork, and uh, I couldn't sing, so I played harmonica. I'd go down on my knees, and they'd put the cape on me and carry me off stage, and, you know, I thought it was a good act. I was imitating him, but little did I know I'd be working at the barn with Wayne Cochran, another James Brown imitator, and uh, eventually we got a job at the barn on uh, the Miami Causeway. Uh, we'd come off stage, they'd, it was one continuous set, you know, they'd play their last song and we'd come up and imitating James Brown along with Wayne Cochran, you know. I love James Brown. It was, I'd go to the drive-in movie by myself. Sit, there was no video, you know, there was no videotapes or anything or YouTube that you could watch. And so I had to study this guy and see, see what he was doing. And I remember one night I was uh, at the drive-in movie watching James Brown. He came out on one foot and I said, man, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And everybody at the drive-in started honking their horns and turning their, their lights on and off. And I thought, oh man, everybody's into it. Everybody likes it. And then the picture went out and they went to the next reel. And I said, what? I want to see, I came here for James. So I went to the projection booth, you know, and I talked to the guy and I said, I said, hey, I came to see James Brown. Why'd you turn it off? And he goes, everybody hated it. You know, that, that's why they were honking their horns. And it made me so sad. And, I, and so that was one of my first encounters with black and white in the 60s in America. And I started seeing how things work, you know, and that, that also brought me to the blues. Let's backtrack a while. And uh, you have mentioned that Jimmy Reed at Carnegie Hall was a real early influence. Can you talk about early blues records you bought or ran into? That Wherever I lived, in any town, I always knew where the local record store was. Uh, I could ride my bike there. And then when I finally got a license when I was 16, I could drive my car there. And I always hung out at the record store because it was 45s. I always bought 45s. I did, before then, I actually bought 178, which was was transfusion by Norvis Nervous or something. Yeah, Nervous Nervous. Right. Yeah. And it was a 78. But after that, I bought 45s. And so I always knew where the local record store was. So when I'd, you know, be feeling down and, uh, you know, longing longing for the blues and all that, I'd, I'd go down to the record store and I was going through the same bins, you know, and the same, you know, Rolling Stones, Dave Clark Five. And, oh, you know, they're okay, you know, and, you know, Jerry and the Pacemakers. And so I looked over in the corner and there was a, there was a little, in the dark little corner, there was just, just a little little rack, and it said blues. It had a little handwritten sign, blues. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So I went over there, and I looked. Uh, I started looking at the blues. I said, wow, look at some of these guys. Red Fox was in there. I said, I don't know, he doesn't belong in here. And I came across Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And I said, what? Wow, that looks cool. And I turned it over and, and said, you know, he's, he's from Chicago, and he, he recorded this album. It was the first Butterfield Blues band, born in Chicago. He'd been playing, he, he recorded that album in New York, but he was from Chicago. And so, you know, I didn't think much of it, so I bought a couple albums and I brought it home and I put it on. And from the moment I heard Born in Chicago, you know, I couldn't believe that harp sound. I said, man, that's it. This is what I want to do. It's amazing how many lives that album changed. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, cha it changed mine. It made me be convinced that that's what I want to do the rest of my life. It really hooked me in the blues. Like I had, when I was a little kid, five years old, I kind of, you know, I kind of got a, the blues tingling. But when I heard Paul, it was like a pit bull bit my ankle and wouldn't let go. I said, man. I care what mama did now. Boogie boogie, yeah. I was walking down Hastings Street. I heard everybody talking about the Henry Swank Club. I 
outside and I'll drop in there one night. And I was glad I did. And I got there. I said, yes, people. It was really having a ball. Look at you. <laughs> Mother Blues was the place that everybody, that all the blues bands had relocated to. And I met Lorraine Blue there, and uh, she used to let me in. I was a regular. So I'd go there every night and just sit around, and that's when I had to find a, a band and get a job and, and learn these blues. And what year would this have been? When did the Butterfield album come out? It was just a couple of years past that, so. So in fact, 67, 68? Yeah. So I went to uh, Mother Blues and I just sat there every night and, and I said, I gotta, get, I gotta learn the blues. I gotta find somebody, you know, to, to, let, to teach me blues and learn. Cause I was doing okay, but I, you know, I played a little harp and a little guitar, but I went to Mother Blues and, I, and so I started sitting in with bands. So. Uh, any night, Magic Sam, you know, every night there was blues. There was Magic Sam, Otis Spann, uh, Albert Collins, uh, Howlin' Wolf. And so I just started forcing myself to sit into bands. And I sat down with Magic Sam for a song, and he didn't need any help. He, just, he was real, you know, real distant. Howlin' Wolf was playing there. And Wolf, man, can I, you know, can I, you know, could, could I jam? I'm, I'm a new guitar player in town here, and I'm looking for a job. And he goes, oh. They used to you come around later, maybe, you know. And so last set, he brought me up. At that time, I'd heard the original Butterfield album, and Mike Bloomfield was a star guitar player. So I'd never heard, never heard real blues guitar before, you know. And Bloomfield was fast and frantic. And so I thought, well, that's the faster you are, the better guitar player you are. So Wolf starts a good song. I don't know what it was, 44 or something. It was a good song. And so he started playing, and he nodded at me, and I... I started, and he goes, da, 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 slow down, you know, and so I said, okay, and so the song ended, and he goes, listen, I'm going to give you one more chance, all right, just take your time, just take your time, and uh, I said, well, uh, I thought he meant, well, tease the audience, let go four, six, or eight bars or something, and then come in. You know, so I said, okay, I'll take my time. So I just hugged my guitar. So he started the song, and I said, uh huh, that's right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna impress you now. And so and then he said, and then he said, all right, go ahead. <laughs> and, and he just stopped me and he took my arm and he goes, let's give him a hand as he leaves the bandstand, ladies and gentlemen. It's really rude or somebody. I don't know. Well, so, so supposedly he told Jimi Hendrix a lot worse than that in St. Louis. Wow. But, so, uh, so I'm re I've been rejected by the best. You know? So, <laughs> anyway, so that was my audition with him. And so, so how was it there that you uh, sat in with Otis too? That, yeah, Mother Blues. Um, I just kept sitting in with people and forcing myself in the band. Refused to be fired, and uh, and then Otis was playing one night. A real gentleman, didn't look like a blues guy. He had a tie and a nice shirt, and he always wore a suit. And, you know, real well groomed. You know, a gentleman, very polite, soft spoken. And uh, I, I said, Otis, you know, I ambushed him in the corner, and uh, you're, you're really great. And uh, you know, I, I, could I sit in? And you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking for a job, but you know, maybe I could sit in with you. And he goes, All right. And, What's your name? And it's, uh, Bi uh, Billy Pruitt. So he goes, Okay, Prudence, we're gonna let you in. <laughs> and he called me the whole time. He always called me Prudence. And so, so he brought me up. I did real good, man. He, you know, I and I learned my lesson from Wolf. I just took my time and I played nice. And so after the set, you know, I thought, man, I, you know, I probably blew this one too, you know, but I got to get a job. And so he came to me, you know, after the set, and he goes, "Hey, how would you like to join my band?" I said, "Yeah, uh, yeah, okay." You know, and goes, "Okay, well, you can be a member of my band." I said, sure. And so that '69, we did uh, Ann Arbor Blues Festival. Uh, Sammy Lay, uh, you know, Ernest Gatewood, uh, Eddie Shaw. But you and I had a, a fateful night at the I Spy, right. which back in the day, too, was, was known as the rock and roll, apparently. A lot of the. Well, that was the, the I Spy, they had a painting 
of a guy with a gun, right, like a, a James Bond a thing. A silhouette, right, shooting a drake <laughs> right, out of somebody's right. head. And that was the, yeah, that just was, what you need in a bar. Right, right. And a, yeah, right and a, uh, that was where uh, we got the thrill of witnessing the owner of the I Spy not only shoot Otis's new used Coupe de Ville that he had bought with his advance right. for doing morning in the morning. Right. Get, they sh the owner shot him, his car in the fender, but you mentioned harmonica player Jeff Karp. Right. He was playing with Sam Lay at the time, and Sam was drumming with Otis that night, and his band was alternating sets. And um, when, the, when the owner ran out on the street shooting after a guy who I'll let you describe in, in a minute um, and shot Otis's car, can you talk about how that, that incident unfolded? Well, well, you were there, right? You were. Yeah, I was one of six guys sitting in right. a booth all trying to be the first guy under the table, right. and none of us could move. Right, you got wedged in and nobody yeah. could move. You had a better vantage point right. than that. So. And I was on the other side of the stage with Otis, and then... Uh, all I knew is we started playing, and I heard pop, 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 and I saw Otis dive under the table, on, under the table on the other side of the club, and you were stuck, you were stuck underneath, and boom, 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 and and kept hearing these shots, and so I got under the table with Otis, and there I was, there here he was, a gentleman with a with a white shirt and a tie on, and. His chin was like on the floor, and every time, boom, boom, he jump, you know, and and there I was, you know, laying on my chest right next to him, and he goes, "Well, Prudence, you you wanted to learn about the blues, didn't you?" And boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I said, "Damn," you know, and 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 we survived, right? We're survivors. That reminds me of another name mangling at Mother Blues involving Janis Joplin. Can you talk about about that. Jan yes, Janis Joplin was in town for some show. Uh, I talked to Corky Siegel, and he said he picked her up for that show. Uh, I knew Corky and all those guys. I was living on the south side at 71st and Lakeshore Drive. It was like a hippie crash pad. There was 10 of us all sharing the rent, and there was like eight bedrooms, and everybody was sleeping in the attic and everywhere. And Tom Swan lived in that uh in that house with me. Yeah, uh, he, Tom Swan worked for Chess, it was uh, mostly reissues, but he produced part of Muddy Waters after the Rain album. I was good friends with Tom Swan. He was a heavily influenced blues guy. And then next door there was Jeff Karp or somebody, he was a harp player. And I guess Janice was seeing Jeff Karp next door. So Jeff said, well, Otis, Otis is playing with Billy down at Mother Blues, why don't we go down there? And I was playing the one night, she walks in, you know, and I remember looking, and, and she was sitting where I usually sit in the booth right across the stage. And so she's sitting there, and I guess she's with Jeff Karp or two of yeah, them. Yeah, she was with Jeff. Was it but, Jeff? I mean, I don't know about that night, but they were... Uh, right, they were a couple yeah. for a while, right? Because she was, she was over there for quite a while. Janice is sitting there, and so I, you know, God, Janice Joplin, man, she was huge at that time. It was right around Monterey Pop, and, every, you know, I said, Otis, man, I said this. I says, Janis Joplin's right here, you know, maybe maybe you should invite her up to sing, you know. And he goes, who? And I said, J Janis Joplin. He goes, oh, okay. So he says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest in the house tonight. Janet Joplin is with us tonight. Janet Joplin. Let's see if we can't get her up. Let's give her a hand. And she was real offended, you know. She goes, I'm not Janet. And... Uh, <laughs> So he goes, come on, she's probably shy. Jenna Joc Jocelyn is a jo Jocelyn, Joplin. What is it, Prudence? I said, that's a, uh, close enough. And she goes, F you, Otis, I'm, I'm not, no, I'm not playing. And Otis goes, what, what's going on? I said, I don't think she's going to play. What uh, led you away from Otis? What led me away from Otis was... I played with him for years, you know, just the bad neighborhoods, and I had no idea how big Otis was. When I, when I went to Mother Blues and auditioned for him and sat in with him, I had no idea. I thought Wolf and Otis and Magic Sam, I thought these guys were just a good local band. That I, I had no idea they were already legends in Europe. They had already been recording for 10 years in Europe and Sweden. They were already legends. I had no idea, which helped me ultimately because I wasn't starstruck. He was just the leader of a good local band. And you know, I said, well, I got to get join one of these local bands. I still didn't realize the magnitude of the writing and all the, uh, the genius of it all and the legend of it all. So let's talk about Lowell George. Lowell, yeah. Yes, Lowell George, to me, he was just the greatest, you know, singer and slide player. And I, I had seen him in Mothers of Invention when I heard the Paul Butterfield at Cafe A Go-Go. 
And so I'd always followed him, you know, and listened to his music and Little Feet, F-E-A-T, by the way. So one night he's playing at Park West, and uh, this is just a, a few weeks before he died. I bought an NBC jacket from the NBC store, and but back then there was no security. You know, you just walk like you know what you're doing, and then you know they'd see a guy with an NBC jacket, and they go, "Oh, go ahead," you know, and I go, "Excuse me," and so I. I got in there for sound check, and Lowell was there. I said, Lowell, you know, I'm a guitar player, yeah, da, da, da. and I've got, uh, I've got a bunch of songs here. Maybe you'd be kind enough to consider recording, you know, something. And go, oh, okay. So he took the songs, you know, and everything, and went through the rest of the sound check there that night, and talked to him some more, and you know, became became friends with him. And so after the after the show, I thought, well, you know, I went home. So I said, well, I forgot completely about that. And then about a year later, I got this letter. I opened it, and, and the letter said, December 9th, 1979. This letter is at least a year old, but I thought you'd like to have it. Sincerely, Elizabeth George. Well, here's the letter I got from Lowell George. And it still gives me chills, and it means a lot to me, and it's really precious to me. And he even wrote it on holiday and stationery from the Holiday Inn on Lakeshore Drive. And I'll read a little for you. Hi, Billy. I read through some of your songs and a couple caught my attention. If you have any demos... I would like to hear how you put them to music. A cassette of just voice or guitar or piano. It's fine for me. Sorry I couldn't make your gig last night, but I was beat. I did try to edit one lyric. This may be a bit presumptuous of me to suggest, but there is real potential and an interesting song idea. I hope I didn't offend you. I think you've got some good song ideas for your career and other artists to do as well. Believe me, that can do no harm, especially when the royalty checks come in. Thanks again, Lowell George. Whew. You know, what gives me the chills about this is that he talked to me as an equal. And he wrote this letter about two weeks before he died, and I didn't get it till a year later. And his wife, Liz, was nice enough to send it to me. So just like his song says, so many letters don't get written and don't get sent. But I got mine. Thanks, Lowell. All the letters never written that don't get sent. It comes from confusion. Said that uh, among his legacies is your all-time favorite song. Rock and Roll Doctor to me is just the ultimate, the 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 way the words and the music and the rhythm density. Lowell used to say the rhythm density of the song and the words about a rock and roll doctor. It's a monument he built to himself. And I think, to me, Rock and Roll Doctor is my favorite song ever. And then what led you off the music scene and when? What led me off the music scene was I'd been playing so long, I'd been, I'd been playing six decades, but I had carpal tunnel in my thumb here, the, a lot of pain, and, and, and it was hard to play, and so I thought, well, maybe my playing days are over. So I hung up my rock and roll shoes, and I just sat and I watched TV for years. 2016, I was putting the Otis Rush tribute together at uh, Grant Park for the Bl Chicago Blues Festival, and I, I really had no idea what you were up to or anything like that, but I think Rawl Hardman posted something about being on it, and you commented on his post, and, you know, when I saw your name, I can't remember exactly how it went from there, but I remember, uh, you know, I thought, well, yeah, hey, if you're still around, I mean, you know, you were one of the first guys that <laughs> taught me which end was up when I didn't know my posterior from a hole in the ground back, uh, back in the bring... days. You were one of the first guys around here who was nice to me, or, you know, saw that I had an interest. You uh, gave me some advice when I made my first live tape of Otis over on Pulaski there. So um, anyhow, I mean, I was I was pleased that it, that it, it had worked out. And the, there were a few people I didn't realize at the time how long it had been since they played. Sam Burton, the drummer, told me he hadn't played for five years. And uh, of course now you know, too many people are gone already from a show that was June of 2016, Eddie Clearwater, Mike Ledbetter, Eddie Shaw, yeah, yeah and Otis, of course. Down 
need it when you really want to blow your top. <laughs> That's them good old days with me, man. I, I, I get kind of sad when I hear stuff like that because I know them guys ain't here no more, you know? It makes me a little, a little sluggish. I was, uh, yeah, I saw the Otis Rush tribute and I thought, geez, I was his first permanent member. So I, I kept calling the city and, and the girls would go, oh, uh, you know, Richard Sherman is taking care of that, and that rang a bell. I said, oh, oh, well, tell Richard, Billy Pruitt is, is available. Let me check my schedule. Yeah, I can do it. And they kept saying, well, we gave him the message, and no response, no response. It was so hard to reach you. And so finally, you sent me an email. I saw Richard Sherman. I said, oh, here, here's the Dear John letter, you know, because they said we got, we got 20 guitar players already, and we don't need any more. And then you sent me that nice email, and it said, you certainly deserve to play, and yeah, ta, 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 and that was... I, man, I appreciate that so much. And you got me back into, so you rekindled my whole spirit of uh, wanting to play the blues again. And, and when I did that tribute, now I met all the young blood that's coming up, you know, all the, you know, Mike Wheeler. All right, I got a friend that's going to come up here and blow some hops with us. How about I tell you about the great Billy Pruitt? guys you know Mike Ledbetter and I would have never met them otherwise you know and I'd like to I've never publicly thanked you on camera but uh, you know without that you know I, I, I would still be at home watching TV and so as it turned out I ended up getting surgery on these hands and now I can play better than I ever have you know so I like where I am today it's working out so what, so what are, what are your passions in life now at, at this point um, I like where I am. I like just sitting in all the time. I don't want to load martial amps at four in the morning in the snow. And I like just jumping up and playing a set now and then. How do you want to be remembered? Uh, I don't, with a smile, I guess, you know, as a, as a guy that had a pretty good little run. And uh, I'm going for a hundred, you know. I, I, not, I think the oldest Bluetooth guy is actually probably Jimmy Johnson or... Who did we say, Mark? Somebody else was... Henry Gray. Henry Gray is how old? 94. Wow. See, so if I could pull a hundred off and be the old, be the old blues guy, that uh, that would make my day. But if I don't make it, then uh, we still got this, and I think we should do this in another 51 years. Sounds good. I'm down. Does that sound good? Are you oh, yeah. okay? Great. That's a wrap. They say the measure of a man's life comes down to the moments he remembers most. My special moments include black musicians sharing their friendship and music with me. Otis Rush had once told me the two most important days of our life are the day we were born and the day we discover why.